kind of. <laughs> I don't know, we could ask Sam. He's also married. Mm-hmm. You need time alone, right, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you mean your research doesn't get enough of your time? <laughs> That's my time alone. That's what I can say. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming yeah. and staying persistent with uh, completing the course. Who should we send email reminders? Uh, Javed is talking to Svetlana, so I don't know if you have to see it. Okay, so... Um, the definition of great should be... He's talking about his minis, I believe. Okay. No. <laughs> Any, anyone else? Faisal? Who was named Basil by Levi? Come on, Brad. And Whitney, does she come on Thursdays? She's presented on Thursdays. Okay, okay. The lab or something. Yeah. So, who we are and what are we doing here? Ah, good attendance. <laughs> I'm starting to forget who we are and what are we doing. <laughs> Maybe you do remember. So, we want to be called combination chemists at least part of the time. We are taking horse with some related name and we do bring the lights and we try to model materials we try to uh, get computational model of materials and get some background tools for it so we do have the uh, four sections in the in the course for yeah, we do have four sections in the course for building atomic models for elementary Cartier Fock theory, density functional theory, and the excited state theory. And each of the chapters is accompanied by labs and presentations of, of the <coughs> achievements of those who, who take the class. So we are done with uh, density functional, we have started excited states, and this is kind of entertainment for you, that I will be mumbling something of it. Right now, our main goal is to complete our research presentations. And uh, I think we do have very well-established problems and models uh, for most uh, of attendees of the class, right? There, there is one model that can be a little bit improved co cooperatively, but it's like 95% perfect. So I'm going to make some administrative announcements to distribute some handouts, and then you will win back, switch lights off, take popcorn, and listen to some uh, entertainment related to excited states. It is good for, for your career and for making uh, the modeling more precise, but you already have the core knowledge that allows you to like, uh, survive if, if you need some, some computation. So I'm trying to keep the same numbers of the lectures which were in previous years, therefore it may look uh, a little changed, but the consecutive numbers is, is we are coming to the number 25, 26, and there should be a total of 30 meetings with um, here I am bringing the I don't know if you, if you need so much details, just for your approval 
the tentative schedule. If someone has um, scheduled conflicts, which happened to all of us, including me, last, last meeting, uh, uh, please let me know in, in advance. I also have a question um, about the traditions of celebrating Thanksgiving. Am I right, assuming that there will be no class on uh, Thursday, on Thanksgiving Thursday? <laughs> the university is closed. So I shouldn't count on this meeting. Oh, okay. Good. Probably not. Okay. <laughs> then we do have how many? Today, next Tuesday, then we skip. Thanksgiving, another Tuesday, another Thursday, and another Tuesday. So total five min uh, meetings left. And I will become, uh, because some of you told that they have travel plans for the 7th. And I will come on Thursday 8th, but it is not mandatory. It's only if you want to set up your research plan for the rest of the life and make some discussion. But formal last meeting is on Tuesday, December 6th. Um, so we do need one meeting assigned to presentations that I hope you will uh, be enthusiastic to prepare in the same style as, as we did before based on your research and there will be um, a little review session on the written summaries of your, of your, um, of your research. It shouldn't be too hard. It will be like very brief summary, much easier than uh, oral presentations. And before that, we will uh, three meetings in a relaxed manner. We will split our time between discussing excited states and coming back to practical skills or organization of the of the research. And I hope the schedule doesn't look as a big uh, pressure, although. End of semester is pressure for everyone. I think you, many of you are, are feeling it. Okay. So there will be, just to keep, okay. So um, <coughs> handouts. Historically, from previous uh, attempts to uh, present this course, it was moderate success of converting individual research into uh, ongoing research program and uh, including outcomes of this research into your thesis primary research activity, which would be, would be great. It's up to you. I do not care what you do after the course ends, but you may find it beneficial. And um, at the last couple of meetings, the previous year uh, participants were preparing very brief reports on the research. And uh, here are the examples. So you can just pass them through. Just give, they, they all are different. Uh, pass around, so it just gives an idea how the, um, explanation of what you were doing as a research project can be, can, can be summarized. So it is really short, like three, four pages with some figures that uh, if you include sp space for figures, it's not much writing. It can be done in like a couple of hours. But. Uh, what, which other handouts? So if you are still working on some of the homeworks from the past and your schedule didn't allow to complete them, feel free to submit. Uh, but uh, there will be no mandatory homeworks anymore. Uh, I will distribute something that is formulated as a homework, but it is not mandatory. Feel free to skip it, it's just uh, to inspire your mindset if you, if you need it. So the attempt to explain your research project 
may need a little component of uh, methodology, especially if you are thinking about about converting it later into um, competitive research presentation. And you may just look through and summarize for yourself, for yourself in your mind, <coughs> or write a brief uh, like paragraph summary on some subjects that can be later included into explanation of what you were doing. So I'm not caring of it anymore. I know that you, you already have a minimal or maybe above minimal level of knowledge, but you may practice verbalizing it. Uh, verbalizing in writing rather than uh, guessing and uh, hand waving explanation. Oh, we have <laughs> extremely high attendance today. <laughs> Who's our special guest? <laughs> and because your research projects are relatively diverse, some of you may need like this. Um, focus on triplets, and some of you may not. But most of you will need a bit of explanation on absorption spectra, because it is uh, relatively universal, observable, that most of us are using even characterizing materials. So um, some of the subjects that are in this optional, it's a better word, optional it doesn't sound good in the uh, university. Extra credit <laughs> um, To find your own vision of what are Einstein coefficients and how are they related to absorption spectra via computing. Because there is nothing complicated. There are no ex additional concepts. They, they are, are all built in a closed circle, like transition time, <coughs> oscillator strength, Einstein uh, coefficients radiation lifetime, they all are interconnected and one can be derived from another one. If you know one, you know the three others. Uh, and if you practice how to express it from your perspective, from your point of view, it can be really helpful in your later career. So another little handout is an example. It's also redundant. You are already doing it, but just in case, it is a little reminder that one of the practically helpful things is to make some effort into organization of directors so that they are unified and if you do standard set of uh, characterization, numerical characterization techniques, you may want to um, Keep them organized and uh, make it easier for yourself to, to browse through them. Because sometimes, well, it is, it, it is not rare when some data are not interesting or wrong or garbage, but when you analyze the data, some of them may become really impressive and, and helpful. And then uh, at the last minute, you need to pull right pieces of data put them into either tables and, and figures. And if you originally make a little effort into organizing your directories according to what the chemical composition, what is the electronic configuration, what is the temperature, it will be much, much easier to do some um, last minute activity that many people practice. Um, what else? So what we are doing is very helpful. It is competitive, competitive, but it is not hard. So, um, and I am going to distribute, it was short page flipping over, therefore it's not easy to, to see. So it's uh, two pages from a publication prepared by undergraduate student, not the last year, undergraduate, like second or third, on uh, the similar type of characterization. And partially it addresses what is formulated as the extra credit homework. So how the calculations of the type that we are doing connects to Einstein coefficients, absorption, and how one can verbalize and formulate. And you'll see that uh, 
even if you're not in the graduate school, it is possible to um, express some of these basic ideas. I'm done with distributing handouts. Homework is optional. Uh, projects. <clears throat> I believe that everyone agrees with this list. And uh, last night I changed just one for FISAL. Instead of sodium yttrium fluoride, it is now cal calcite or calcite. How do you pronounce it? Calcite. Calcite? OK. And um, the rest of the uh, research works are split into reaction dynamics, electron transfer, and uh, characterizing of the exotic uh, spin configurations. Right? Um, so, no objections on the list of subjects. If you feel that you want something better, we can cooperate and discuss it one to one, but as soon as possible. Run, uh, set up your jobs and run them as quick as possible. Because, well, submit them because uh, it will take time. And right now we are doing a modest request of numerical resources. As, as I have seen, each of you are requesting default number four CPUs per job, which is very good to do it as a big group. But if you see that someone is very behind the rest of the group in uh, going forward. If some jobs are really taking resources, we will go and request more resources for specific jobs. So do not hesitate to bring my attention to this fact, because we, we need to have everyone being far enough by next one. Um, there was some issues with the technical issues with the cluster that we have resolved yesterday. And if you were missing uh, yesterday lab, please uh, contact me or contact your colleagues in the class to ask how it was resolved to be able to, to run jobs efficiently. OK. <clears throat> so primary tool for excited state description is so-called time-dependent density functional theory. And although it has the word time-dependent, um, nothing in the computational procedure follows time-dependence. So uh, it is just historical trace of the derivation of the equations. In order to derive time-dependent density functional theory, people, for a short period of time, think about time-dependent Schrodinger equation, but then come with equations which are time independent. They are just targeting to find oscillator strengths and transition energies for given molecule. And uh, there are other more or less efficient theories for excited state description, but uh, in the remaining time, it is good if we cover just one and uh, get sufficient proficiency so that you get skills of um, organized approach to this learning, and then you can cover the rest of the uh, theories yourself if you feel it is needed. So we better go deeper in one direction rather than split efforts. OK. I think it is where we did stop uh, last time. And uh, if no one objects, I better will be scratching on the, on the blackboard. Because we can flip through slides in five minutes and get no imprint of in, on our memory. And if you go slow but, but surely, then we can discuss. And uh, 
get the truck of what is doing. So, if we do not touch new theories, if you do not touch just uh, the functional theory or configuration interaction, if we have only tools for single determinant ground state density functional theory. We still have zeros order approximation that uh, can approximately describe excited state. So you can enforce repopulation of uh, orbitals that do approximately correspond to, to an excited state. So this was uh, what Whitney was uh, presenting on her presentations. And by the way, uh, all presentations are uploaded in the raw way, but Last time it took me like two weeks to arrange them in the chopped and uh, order with titles. So right now they are just raw video materials. And uh, remind me, I can share the link, but it is the last thing uh, I was recording on, on the channel. So everything what you were telling is, is recorded and you can use it as a reference. So it um, presented lowest order excited state. On one hand. On another hand, we all are doing absorption spectrum in the approximation of non-interacting orbitals. So we are computing ground state orbitals and use them as a basis to compute transition energies and oscillator strengths. This is not ideal. This is a big approximation, but uh, such approach is very numerically inexpensive and it can be done for, I wouldn't say huge, but for reasonably large systems. So uh, if you do not need to optimize the geometry and you have like up to 3,000 atoms, one can do this uh, non-interacting orbital approach. Time-dependent data function theory will not work, guaranteed. So it is like a uh, resort for big systems or for limited type of sources. What? What do we need? Why do we need to go to study new theory? Why are we not happy? And what is absorption spectrum? Uh, if we are in the Experiment, then you can tell that absorption spectrum is the profile of uh, intensities as a function of wavelengths, which is specific for each uh, material. Just an optical signature, spectral signature of, of any material. Um, if we are looking on a little bit more details and our simplest approach to compute it, or we can compute as function of energy or, or frequency, and we can consider those as set of transitions with specific transition energies and specific intensities. Spectrum is set of <coughs> transition energies and set of corresponding to them uh, intensities. And then we can count them by some indices. Right? All stuff that we are doing here in the course is just an uh, instrument black box to compute those two sets of data. <coughs> One theory, another theory, they are just source all these two types of data. And if you do if you do have these two sets of data, we can always write uh, absorption spectrum as summation of peaks centered at the 
transition energy, or the other function is peak. And we can uh, rigorously, just for, for definition, for simplicity, one can tell that it is delta function, but in practice it is either Gaussian or Lorentzian with finite width determined by thermal fluctuations of uh, many degrees of freedom, uncertainty, and other factors. And these peaks of delta function of the same width, then all peaks will be of the same height, right? But you know from your previous experience and uh, scientific intuition that peaks in the absorption spectra have different intensities, which means that there are intensities. So it is um, peak and transition energy, and here relative weight of each peak. So practically what we do today and other two meetings, other two theoretical meetings will be just ways to compute set of this uh, I like think it's the radiator. Yes. <laughs> Much better than uh, fire oven. <laughs> <laughs> so we just need to pull this data anywhere. For the projects, the transition energies and those certain strengths do have two indices. Why? Am I lying to you? We have independent particles. Yes, we are in the in the non-interacting non orbitals. So, orbital picture. And there will be more adequate, more precise excitonic picture. So what we what we've told here, the set of transition energies and set of relative weights, they it is appropriate for this uh, excitonic picture. For independent orbital picture, each of our elementary excitation is represented as a pair of orbitals. One occupied and one unoccupied. Then we can tell that large capital index is equivalent to two indices of four. Right? So under one index we, we assume two. And then this summation we also have uh, right now we have summation over all possible excitations, all possible transition energies. But if you want to recast in the independent orbital approximation, then it will be summation over occupied, summation over unoccupied, and 
So it is what we are doing, what is included in uh, in the codes, and what we are presenting. I'm going to draw four lowest four lowest uh, orbitals, four orbitals that are closest to the gap, to the band gap, and uh, just schematically show the transitions, the excitations. Then we, the length of this arrow does correspond to the transition energy. And then we do have an equation to compute oscillator strengths that we can cover later. Otherwise, it will be too busy on the board. plugging in the data for transition energies and forced later strengths into this equation and then later building the figure like this. We can approach this procedure as users. Forget about mechanistic way where the um, parameters are coming from and just see. We have four transitions. And we, we may want to count the transitions on, forget of their structure. So we count transitions on. Count transitions on. Then we have transition number one, which will correspond to this. Uh, We have transition number two, which will be transition number three, transition number four. And then instead of this uh, arrows from occupied to unoccupied. We can make an equivalent figure, equivalent pictorial representation with the ground state, and then list of the excitations. Citation number
So this approach is more general. It is, uh, we will call it oxytonic picture. And here, we do not care about structure of these orbitals. We just care about something which is closer to real life, to obs observables, to what is happening in the experiment. We know that at given frequency, there is a transition of uh, with given intensity. And we do not care, maybe, sometimes, in more advanced theories, we will see that even the lowest transition may be composed not of the single pair of orbitals, but superposition. Several degenerate or nearly degenerate orbitals collectively contribute to one excitation. This is very common. So not elementary excitation, but collection of elementary excitations contribute to actual, to single physical excitation. So it is, I'm just slowly approaching this uh, excited state theory. So it is the direction how we go from elementary excitations to collective, to excitations that are superposition of um, elementary excitations. Whether independent orbital or excitonic picture, we still are under the same understanding and physical interpretation. Transition energies and intensities. It is what we need to compute. What else is excitonic here? Well, electrons and holes have different charges and therefore they experience Coulombic attraction. Therefore, if we remove an electron from occupied orbital, we can see it as all areas of space where this orbital uh, was taken. Now we have an additional positive charge, lack of negative charge. And if we promote to another orbital, which may have been distributed in a different way in space, this area of space gets additional negative charge. And this positive and negative charges interact. Attractive. Therefore, if we create an excitation, typically the excitation energy decreases compared to non interrupting orbital difference. Although there are additional mechanisms that may, may change it all also to increase, but the transition energy changes if we take into account actual repopulation of orbitals, actual electron hole interaction. And those interaction of uh, electron and hole are reflected in most of the excited state theories. And therefore, we need more advanced theories to get more precise data on the transition energies and intensities of transitions. So this motivation why uh, we are OK, but not 100% happy with what we are doing right now. So we understand that. The approach that we are doing is um, an intermediate step that works for bigger system, but if you want to be really precise, we need to use something more uh, high order theories. Okay. So we need theory to compute transition energies more precisely. And first order things. How do we compute oscillator strengths? Expectation value of going from occupied orbital to unoccupied using the transition dipole moment operator. Uh huh. Very good. Very good. Uh, I should have put camera on you <laughs> because it, it it was uh, it was correct. It was good. <laughs> But uh, it's a good starting point. So how do we get us to either strengths? And uh, if it is in the independent orbital approximation, then we have two indices. 
So Levi told that there is a connection <coughs> between oscillator strength and so-called transition dipole vector. It's a constant time transition dipole vector square. Yes, exactly. And uh, we will try our memory, our skills to operate Wikipedia and, or Google to get these constants. I did this homework and played them in just slides, but I do not, yeah, I do not recall <laughs> it from the top of the head. We can spend time and derive them, but so constant. And there should be like one constant uh, transition energy, mass of electron in, uh, in some powers. So, in order to get oscillator strengths, we need to know the transition dipole, right? And Levi was dictating how to get it. <coughs> Is it what you were telling? Yeah. So we take much experiment of position operator for this position of the electron <coughs> from occupied to unoccupied. So if you are hundred percent sure that the vector is a three component, you may lean back and relax. I'm going to add three lines more just to make it just to underline it. But there will be no, no idea. So D I G X. E This is very simple and silly, and uh, if I would be, I, I wouldn't try it. But just in case, we better discuss it so that uh, if someone asks you, you do not fall into a trap. So, if I apologize if it is very clear and you knew it from, from the kindergarten, but you better speak it out. So, if there is a little arrow at top of a symbol, it means it is a vector. A vector means a little arrow in space that have, has direction. If you represent it algebraically, it means the vector is represented by three components, projections on x, y, and z. And since we are finding this vector numerically, it means that we are actually finding three components. So for each pair of orbitals, i and j, we are finding x projection, y projection, and z projection. Right now, we will use a little expansion of this formula, but some of you may deal with polarized spectroscopy experiments. When uh, one uh, excites and takes responsive system with different polarizers. And then the responsive system and orientation may become important. 
right now, no one of us is doing it. We do not have any of the projects, but who knows where your career will bring you. Or maybe uh, someone will buy an experiment, or maybe on your optical table, you just mount a couple of polarizers and see what happens. Then, those are new. And we already have them in the protocol, in the procedure. So we are not just uh, blind users who use as a black, as a black box and uh, use this uh, oscillator strengths. We have intermediate data on the components, projections of transition data. But those are you multiplied by the constant, but you have to consider the constant. If you, like if you go into the oscillator strength and if you go to the X component, is that already multiplied by the constant? Well, or do you have to? Right now, we are assuming that we have an ensemble of our systems which is isotropically distributed. Therefore, if we look through exact expression for this constant, it will have some uh, algebraic fraction like 3 over 2, whatever, that comes after average over uh, spherical angles. So that all possible orientations are possible. But <coughs> if we, if the system, so here is a little Gedanken experiment, thought experiment. If you have a polar set of polar molecules, we apply strong electric field so that they all are oriented in space. And then we have a polarizer so that only uh, they are oriented along X and the light has only a uh, component along X. Then presence or absence of transition dipole on Y and Z will not affect the optical response of the system. So it, is, uh, it takes more effort to find match between polarization of the light, or polarization of the molecules, and uh, output. Orientation of molecules, molecules in space is exotic. It's rare. But what is what it could be more typical to um, explore the random rotations of molecules? So you excite only with given polarization, then you give it a little time to rotate, and then you see that output comes with different polarization. And the component of the different polarization is the larger, the longer you wait. Because they perform free free rotation. So we have a foot in the door for these advan advanced techniques, but we are not covering them too much. Okay. So three components. Each of them is a scalar, and each of them computed as the three integrals. Each orbital depends on three coordinates. There is only one uh, Cartesian projection, and then we perform integration. Therefore, in the table of, of the five oscillator strengths, last three columns are dx, dy, dz for given pair of orbitals. This information is at your disposal. You can uh, use it. So how do we get the DIJ score? Yes. So you can just compute the, it, its length and take square, right? Um, or you can do the same as we do for, it's, it's all the same. In space, if you have origin and you have point in space, then difference between them is uh, um, x square, y square, z square, right? Okay. If you have algebraic of it as a vector, then we can formulate it as a scalar product. Right.
rules, <coughs> same as we find distance, square distance in the Cartesian space, same for uh, transition diagrams. And probably no one of us is going to put it, these simple equations in the description of the methodology and break it in, in the public. But just in case if uh, <laughs> someone asks you how they are computed, just to avoid confusion, it's better if you together pronounce and, and discuss it together. So this all was for the independent orbital approximation. How do we compute transition diagonal if we are in the excitonic picture? And what is our basis? Like how do we describe the excited states if we are in the excitonic picture of excitations? Just rotates now with J. It is okay for this equation. But uh, if we are here, it will not always be practical. Well, one can apply equation like this if we have if we are in the wave function approach by configuration interaction, if you, uh, if you do have wave function for ground state and wave function for one of the excited states. Then the same procedure can be applied. And actually, about 10 lectures ago, we did a derivation. How to get this approximate equation out of the um, transition density matrix, matrices computed in the basis of slated determinant for ground and for excited uh, wave function. If you scroll back few lectures, we will see this derivation. Uh, we'll sp spend too much time if I'll try to repeat it right now. But our goal is not only the exactness, precision. We are not in the math department. We have a substantial component of applied research. And any theory, even elegant theory, has a um, criteria of judgment whether it is practical in respect of low numerical resources. And just by today, the um, best proportion between numerical resources and precision for excited states is achieved with a so-called T D D F. T theory. And this TDFT theory, as you can see, originates from density functional theory and it deals with density rather than wave functions. <coughs> Therefore, the style of computing transition dipole will be different. We will use different equation to compute transition dipole. Um, a little disclaimer. In our discussion, we are not going linearly straightforward through uh, all derivations as we did for density functional theory. Now we are starting basically from, from the end, from the observables, to that uh, we keep enough enthusiasm, we understand what are the goals, and uh, technical details are not our primary objective. We need to see connections and uh, practical implications. On the other hand, who knows um, what will be our pace? We cannot skip presentations and uh, review of the write-ups. And if you need to sacrifice something, then we will sacrifice the precise derivations. But we are going to get main idea at, at any rate. Okay. So. Oh. Compute transition dipole. Dipole in T 
I'm not asking how to find transition energies, although I should. Because if we look back, then again I'm repeating, I don't know if I need to repeat it, but I'm repeating the same basic idea again. All excited state theories are designed in order to generate a set of transition energies and set of oscillator strengths values. And we should look on them from this practical aspect. So the transition energies, we, we also ask how are they computed in TDFT. But they, we will see it anyway. It is straightforward. It is natural. Find transition energies is natural part of anything. Um, Oscillator strength and transition dipole. is a little bit different. There is a different mindset to compute transition data in the tiny band based function theory because it is based not on wave function but density. From density, from rho to transition data. Okay, I suggest we skim through a couple of slides, and if, and then you look on uh, watch. If there is time, I will erase and scratch something else. If there is no time, we will be happy. So, in the independent orbital approximation, we, we, and in any way function based methods, we have orbitals. Original orbital and final orbital, initial and final. And then we superimpose them, place position operator between them, integrate and get transition dipole, and then process it into the uh, oscillator strengths. In the density based theories, we do. Well, we may have orbitals, but theorems do not urge us to do so. Formally, uh, it is density. But we already know from our previous meeting, from previous theoretical meeting, uh, skipping the practical presentation, that if we deal with excited state density, we are using so-called concept of density metrics, where if we still like orbitals as a basis for our density theory, then density metrics elements are expansion coefficients, are proportionality coefficients, are weights in front of each pair orbital. How does it enter into the total density? So this equation is wrong. Well, it is too simplified. Generally, here should be two indices. And this, instead of f, it should be rho. So rho ij, here should be orbital i orbital j, and then we get uh, density. So total density can contributed by pairs of orbital products, products of two orbitals, i and j. And weight, how given orbital is contributing, has Weighting coefficient, density metrics. Good? And then the question of the excited states treatment can be reformulated on the way to find elements of density metrics that correspond to excitation at a given frequency. We know that if you excite system, density rearranges, and relative coefficients that enter composition of density out of orbitals will change. And we may guess intuitively that 
depending on the excitation frequency, these relative contributions of, of uh, pairs of orbitals will also change. In the very oversimplified way, we did it with fairware code, in repopulation code in the uh, VASP software. But generally, we were taking into account only diagonal elements when all orbitals, all orbitals have the same index. Generally, one has to include orbitals with different indices as well. Therefore, I will stay on this slide only, and I need to draw something on the board. So, therefore, our density matrix will include coefficients with pairs of, of indices, and they can be arranged in four symbolic blocks. So indices that correspond to pairs of orbitals that connect only ground state, occupied orbitals. Pairs of orbitals that correspond only to empty states, the orbitals that correspond to excited states. And then there will be very off-diagonal terms that connects occupied and unoccupied orbitals. So I am going to open this idea on the, on the board. No. <laughs> or <laughs> maybe a few seconds later. I do have a backup. <coughs> so, what is shown here on this table? We were doing it uh, last time. So, if we have, for example, four orbitals only, the density matrix will be four by four matrix. And each element has two indices, which shows which pairs of orbitals contribute to the density. If it is ground state density function theory, then we have only these two diagonal corresponding to homos equal to whatever one or two if you have paper, and all the rest of the matrix is zero. If you do have our oversimplified repopulation orbital of orbitals, we make this one zero, this one one, and do this further code. But what is happening if we approach this subject more rigorously. I need to go to the blackboard. I will practice laziness and not feel the rest of the cells because we you saw it there. So what is happening if we apply laser field to the mole? So we apply laser to the molecule. and see consequences on the density density 
and density matrix. This is philosophy. This is like door to start this. And we are not going through all uh, many step derivation. If we start in this direction, later we can answer the question of computing oscillator strengths and transition diagram. Apply laser to the molecule and see the consequences to the uh, density. So what does it mean apply laser to the molecule? We are stepping a little back from all our background of theorems and just chatting of the common sense. Like, if we have electrons in the field of ions, then there is a Hamiltonian that operates electrons. And we can say, or, or if you want to be very precise, we can again play this game and tell that it is kinetic, Electron ion interaction, electron electron interaction, everything for isolated molecule. Isolated. Isolated. On per third. But as soon as we apply a laser, we know that any interaction can be measured by the energy of interaction. Which means the energy operator will be modified. There will be additional term. And since uh, laser is oscillation of electric and magnetic field with given frequency and spe specific space period propagating in some direction, then there will be terms in energy contributed by the electric field component and magnetic field component. But we want to be practical, and our time is limited. Therefore, we will not consider magnetic field components because they are negligible at realistic uh, intensities of electric field. But formally, they should be there. If someone catches you on exam or a conference and asks you a formal definition, do not tell that light is only electric field. It has magnetic components too. I was just witnessing such discussion recently. <laughs> so, what is light? We just told electric, magnetic, oscillating, propagating. And we are forgetting magnetic because of serious reasons. But even electric field. Um, so, some of you need to catch the bus and go to the another lecture soon. Okay. Then I'll just complete the thought. So electric field depends on time and depends on position in space. And these little things are typ typically skipped because they are self-evident and no one needs them in practical chemistry. But formally, one can tell that it is some Polarization vector that oscillates or the plane wave. Or if you know the direction of propagation, then so let's say along X. X lambda is period of oscillations and omega is frequency. If we are talking about optics, this means that um, along X, V, V. 
you have oscillation. So at different points of space, the intensity of the electric field is different. But the period of these oscillations is how many nanometers? Optics. Just approximately order of memory. 500 nanometers. What is the typical size of the molecule? About one nanometer or smaller, right? So for a, uh, for a poor molecule, uh, it doesn't see this uh, out-of-box range of uh, changes in space. It, a molecule sits at a specific place and does see only oscillations with time. Left and right sides of molecules do not see change gradient of electric field because it is negligible. Therefore, we tell that there is some uh, amplitude times cosine omega t. And here we add mu. Uh, we use the letter d. Okay, transition that equals to later times electric field minus in front cosine omega t. So, significant contributions to energy, not all, significant contributions to energy in dipole, electric dipole approximation, are coming by strength, um, amplitude of electric field, times transition dipole operator, times uh, oscillate, oscillate, oscillating field, where this omega is frequency of light. Good? So, if we modify our Hamiltonian by this enrichment, by this additional term, then we will see that the density will change. And the density will change not only in the occupations of orbitals, but there will be substantial change in the off-diagonal terms. And basically, off-diagonal terms will respond to optical perturbation at most. And because of short time, I'm just skipping through and telling intermediate of our far going discussion. Density, time dependent density function theory, is the theory that answers our primary question about transition energies and oscillator strength through finding, through casting an equation for all diagonal elements of density metrics, which are called transition density. Done. Let me announce it formally because our time is up. So let me announce end of lecture 25 and see you on Tuesday. <laughs>